And my topic essentially is about rain-fed agrarian livestock systems and how the Green Revolution paradigm or the scientific facts and the innovation, systemic innovations about that has actually led to quite a despairing picture for most of the agrarian lands in this country. Now, uh, I'm basically uh, based at the Center for Studies in Science Policy, uh, and we have an economic research unit which is solely looking at rain-fed agricultural livestock system. So we have a systemic approach uh, in India. Uh, I would like to actually lay out three things regarding innovation, sustainability, and development, which has to do with the Green Revolution paradigm. In a certain way, uh, the innovation that was the Green Revolution can be broken up into two parts. Essentially, all of you know the science technology part. But what I would like to draw your attention towards is how public investment was used to build an economic mechanism which could just about support any crop but it was actually used to support just two crops from the entire diversified basket of crops that India grew. Now, the economic mechanism, I can go into a greater bit of detail uh, later if you are interested, but very simply, given agriculture has a paradox, if you grow more, then the prices fall. So, of course, there is a price mechanism that has to be uh, taken care of. Public investment was used to subsidize inputs, subsidized, I mean, electricity, give fair price, I mean, better prices than market prices for just two crops, and maybe one more, which is sugar. But uh, that is the kind of economic mechanism, and the public distribution system finishes that entire circle, and a universal public distribution system is actually the basis on which we can actually talk about food security, and not uh, high-yielding varieties only. The innovation that was there in this kind of economic mechanism has actually pulled India out of a kind of a crisis, but at present times, at quite a few of you would probably agree, we are not so much on a strong basis. About sustainability issues. So innovations, there are two kinds of innovations I would like to flag off here. What, one is what are the innovations that are designed for rain-fed areas? Essentially, if we take the assumption that India was rain-fed, and certain areas were given predominance, quote unquote, the irrigated areas. What is the what is the innovation that we need for to specifically design an innovation or a series of innovations for what we are calling rainfed areas, or what even the government today is calling rainfed areas? Secondly, when you come to sustainability issues, there is a question that I still don't have an answer to, which is high growth rates in the short run do give rise to negative externalities, whether it's environmental or sociological or economical or whatever. Now, during the Green Revolution, this was thrown out of, you couldn't question this. So we were growing, uh, agricultural production was growing, and yields were God itself. Hence, you can't question it. But what happens in the long run when you endogenize such negative externalities is that those high growth rates in a long-term trajectory fall flat. So what we see is probably no mud houses, but also no water in Punjab. We also don't see a lot of places which actually have water. This entire thinking about agriculture being dependent on just groundwater is to do with one kind of scientific fact which was accepted, which I don't think was too innovative 40 years down the line. The third thing about development. Now, India, let us probably take this as a basis that there is high degree of socioeconomic inequality. That is the basis on which our developmental question is going to be pitched. Now, if we leave out 68% of farming land, more than 70% of the agricultural workforce, most of the agricultural livestock systems, then are we actually squarely addressing socioeconomic inequality, or is this a different kind of innovation that we are talking of? Now, I am actually part of a network which is trying to revitalize uh, rain-fed agriculture and livestock systems thereof. So I would, one, try and place in front of you, this is a growing network, so there is, this is not finally a fixed situation, and hopefully it's not going to be a fixed situation for time to come. And I just want to talk a little bit on the institutional innovation which the 
RRA or the RLN, which is the rain-fed agriculture or the livestock network is. So this is, this is an emerging structure. There is no fixed situation uh, with this. The, uh, the, you know, the core is basically a group of members who've come together to try and look at what are farming practices, what were these farming practices before or in areas which have been quote unquote neglected, and to see how those innovations can be pulled into a scientific or a technological kind of form which would revitalize most of the lands that are there. Now, if you see those small circles all around, the concentric circles, there are different thematic nodes, and I will come to that in a, in a while. There are various thematic nodes along the concentric circles. The point is, if from the outside, the circles start moving inside, that means it comes more closer towards the core understanding of rain-fed agriculture, the more the network comes closer. So in a certain way, I can talk about the research unit that I head, uh, which is based in JNU. We try and backstop different kinds of work which are being done. So for example, water, you know, there are different issues with water, there are different issues with fisheries, uh, there are different issues with uh, soil salinity, with millets as you know, local production. Different experiments are being tried in different places. There has to be an economic argument at times, unfortunately, that has to be given to make the planners understand that this is viable. There are, of course, other kinds of arguments which most of us, I mean, sadly I'm an economist, but most other people from different backgrounds would probably agree to, but I don't think the planners do agree. So there is a economic rationale or reasoning that is required based on these kind of innovative practices that are being that are that are happening all across the country and another interesting thing that we are trying to build into this is to see what is the kind of growth trajectory because that question unfortunately or fortunately has always to be answered these practices give rise to certain growth trajectories are those growth trajectories as good as the growth trajectories of the Green Revolution or not, and what are the trade-offs? These are the kind of questions that we are trying to answer. As we go along, I'll give a few examples. <clears throat> now, these are different, uh, uh, you know, different organizations we are, which are working on different areas. Again, the same concentric circle kind of thing, and you know, the closer it comes to the core, it basically means there's a convergence of interest, and it's, there's a complementarity between different kinds of uh, thinking that can be brought together. To give you a, a better kind of a example, maybe, is to start, and this is the kind of thing that we've been doing, and this is a dynamic emerging process. We are actually getting into the question of dynamic maps. So over time, how do maps look? Now, this is an old kind of a thing, but we are, so the one on your left is what used to be defined as rain-fed areas. This is taking 30% irrigation, any area which has less than 30% irrigation as the cutoff to be defined as irrigated and non-irrigated. And on your right-hand side is the poverty geography. It's not too difficult to see that areas which have been neglected also happen to contain the most, uh, the highest level of socioeconomic inequalities and the most poor people. Now, starting from that kind of a paradigm, whether you want to look at it from poverty alleviation programs or social development or revitalizing rain-fed agriculture, there is a convergence of interest. Now, of course, one of the main hypotheses that we have been trying to establish and other people also have been trying to establish is that public investments, a huge amount of public investment went behind designing the Green Revolution and sustaining it for a long time. What kind of public investment structures do we need for rain-fed agriculture and low-input animal husbandry? Now, similar to the Green Revolution was the White Revolution, where only some kind, I mean, only milch, cattle, and that kind of production systems were supported. The others were not. So if you take example of tribal areas, uh, where you might have poultry or backyard poultry, there might be goats, sheep, there are immense kind of varieties. The question that needs to be understood or asked is why only certain one particular variety, like rice and wheat, why only one particular milk production was given that kind of backup and the others were not. The other is then to argue that one size does not fit all, hence to argue for a second or a third or a fourth green revolution, the areas that have been left out is not going to serve our purpose. 
So the point is not just to ask for higher public investment or a different architecture, but how to differently design such an architecture so that rain-fed areas don't fall into the same trap as the green revolution areas after 40 years. Now, this is some of the questions we've started asking. This is a just this is not even one year that this unit has come into being. So there is, of course, the question of addressing issues of rain-fed agriculture, the issues of rain-fed livestock, and of course, as the government now sees it, as rain-fed area development. I shall come to this right at the end in, uh, in the last slide. But what we are trying to look at it as a systemic kind of a thing is what are the specificities that each of these have and what are the interlinkages that these areas have. <clears throat> now, in a certain way, the outer circles are the thematic nodes that most of us are working on. So there are issues with water, soil, seed systems, you know, the price support, credit mechanisms. So these are the issues, core issues, nutrients, you know, pest management and other kinds of issues that have been raised, livelihood, labor issues. These are issues which can be only, you know, if I take a very narrow view, these are the issues around rainfed agriculture. Uh, similarly, there can be issues around rain-fed livestock. So, for example, if, I, if, if there is a program, proper vaccination program which reduces morbidity, then the amount of money spent in reducing morbidity, what kind of livelihood support systems can it evolve for poor households who have such kind of thing? And if that kind of a support system has to be built, what is the kind of mechanism that we need to use? Similarly, there are questions with common property resources, grazing lands, issues of health of animals, etc. Now, when we look at rain-fed area development, this is typically a planner's paradise, that there are, of course, existing policies. So there is one way to look at it is that, you know, converge. That's the new catchword, I guess. You converge all the policies. You, that's the push that you were asking for, so you can get, go ahead with this. The other, of course, is what we are trying to articulate is that there needs to be a new kind of architecture which will probably answer these kind of questions. So, of course, in, you know, this is what we are trying to do. On the left is, uh, is what you get by converging existing policies of public investment, which have also been you know, hard, hard fought and hard won, say NREGA, for example. So there used to be this entire myth about NREGA leading to you know, farmers lobbies being very sad about NREGA coming in. Now NREGA is the best thing that is going to happen for rain-fed agriculture. This kind of paradoxical situations are of course existing when you try and converge. Of course the other thing to do is to argue out for a completely new architecture of public investments. Now uh, finally I would want to end with this uh, situation where we have now what is called the Rainfed Area Development Program. Now, this is not yet come into being, but this is being talked about, and there's a document, policy document already for the 12th plan, which looks at rainfed areas as a developmental question. Uh, what we were actually trying to avoid in the beginning, but now left with no choice, we have to get into what is the definition of rainfed areas and the debate on typologies. So what, is, what we've come out with is that the Rainfield Area Development Program out, outlines 424 districts in this country. So by the government's own admission, 424 out of 629 districts are outside the purview of a irrigation, of a, I mean, at least a 30 to 40 percent irrigation cutoff, which is a huge area. What we have come up with is around 380 districts using different agroclimatic zones and taking different cutoffs. So 40% being the national average for irrigation, we have taken 40% irrigation as a cutoff for the humid zones, and the rest we've taken 30%. So even using different kinds of agroclimatic zones and cutoffs, we have come up with a list of 380 districts. What is, however, interesting is out of our list and the government's list, 310 districts match. So there is more than half the districts of this country are rain-fed by any definition. Now, if there has to be a understanding, it has to be a dynamic understanding. So hence, we have actually got into maps, which will be out in the public domain very soon, and not going to be maps which are going to be stored in archives, but will be interactive maps where the population who wants to access those maps can actually look at it over time and add their own to it. The second thing, the final thing, I'll finish with an example, 
is, uh, like I said right in the beginning, the economic mechanism actually supports, could support any crop, X, Y, Z. What, what was done was it supported only rice and wheat. Now, there was an innovative experiment which is being tried in Andhra Pradesh where 61 fair price shops were given an incentive to sell millets. Now, of course, there has been a lot of debate as to, you know, people don't eat millets anymore, it's not in our consumption baskets, but given proper incentives, and what was the incentive? There was an eight rupee per kilo incentive given. So six rupees was the subsidization of production and two rupees was given to make it available in the local PDS fair price shop. What is seen over time is when this experiment goes on for a year, or it's been going on for a year, that a lot of people actually have been demanding and buying millets. So the same kind of argument, as I was saying, was given for rice in the beginning. There are areas which never had rice. But now, over time, they have shifted. The consumption patterns have shifted. Of course, I have nothing against rice or wheat. What I'm trying to say is that out of a diversified basket of 15 or 25 <laughs> crops, we only give the economic incentive to some and then base it on scientific facts that this is the innovative yield and production that has happened. These are the kind of things that we are trying to grapple with. It's an open question, and I'd love to have your responses to that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shastha.